emergency medical services that's running. Good evening, I'm Keith Koontz along with Ian Nyberg. Want to get you uh, up to date with the very latest information that uh, we're getting. And uh, CNN reporting at this hour that there are explosions in parts of uh, Afghanistan. And again, the latest from CNN. And we've also learned that President Bush will address the nation at 9 o'clock tonight. And we're now looking at uh, live pictures from uh, CNN. Uh, one can uh, only guess at this hour what the explosions were, whether it's retaliatory, uh, retaliatory fire from the United States on Afghanistan. Uh, we do not know who is responsible for the attacks on the Twin Towers in New York City and also uh, at the Pentagon. New York area hospitals continue to treat a stream of victims. We, we do not yet have counts at all on, on, on what is happening. Um, but as mm. we know, American military on high alert. Um, tonight across the country as the, the day of terror goes on. That's right, and all this uh, started very early in the morning. Before 9 a.m., a hijacked plane uh, crashed into the World Trade Center, one of the towers there. Less than uh, 20 minutes later, another plane crashed into uh, another tower. You can see the very chilling video and witnesses uh, describing at that point uh, people uh, leaping out of buildings to their deaths. Then just when we thought there couldn't be more chaos, Manhattan skyline was forever changed with the World Trade Center's two towers, as we said, that came down 110 stories. New York Mayor Giuliani is not speculating on how many people died, but the death toll, we can only speculate, is horrendous. Of course, the Pentagon being hit as well. Now, another building in the last 30 minutes collapsed um, just after 5 o'clock tonight which was um, in the eye of where the towers fell. Right. And uh, it was 47, 47 stories, and it came down as well because yeah. it was so heavily damaged. All right, and our uh, News Channel 8 reporter, Alan Cohen, is uh, live tonight in Lower Manhattan with uh, uh, the very latest on this story. And, Alan, you are not far away from uh, the epicenter of this tragedy. That's correct, Keith. And some eight hours after this all began, the smoke continues to billow from the spot where the Twin Towers used to stand. New Yorkers have seen a lot over the years, but nothing like this. Bond trader Andrew Gallagher was at his desk in Tower 2 of the World Trade Center when the first airliner slammed into Tower Number 1. I was on the 55th floor about halfway up, and uh, we heard a boom and windows shook. We saw some debris flying, and we bolted out of the office. But incredibly, Gallagher says, workers were told to stay at their desks. He got out, ran, just in the nick of time. I was about two blocks away, and I turned the corner, and I heard a second boom, and all the windows shook. And I guess that's when the second plane hit the building. Minutes later, the World Trade Center tower he worked in collapsed. He doesn't know how many friends and co-workers are gone. For hours, a steady wave of people who work in Lower Manhattan walk north to escape the smoke, soot, and devastation through Times Square, north to Spanish Harlem, where a fighter plane could be seen flying overhead, securing the airspace over New York City. You can't put it in words. Uh, you know, I'm very happy that all of my employees, uh, are, my friends, are safe, but I, I think about the countless other people. At the bridges and tunnels in and out of the city, chaos. Police closing Manhattan to all incoming traffic except emergency vehicles and the thousands trying to flee a terrorist act, the magnitude of which was unimaginable until now. It's horrifying, it really is. So. It's just Pearl Harbor again. Yeah. And just about 30 minutes ago, yet another building next to the World Trade Center collapses. This one, a victim of collateral damage. This incredible day of tragedy and destruction continues. Keith and Ann, back to you. All right, Alan, Alan, thank you. Uh, we want to go back now to our uh, live pictures from CNN. As we just told you, uh, there have been explosions uh, in Afghanistan. Again, uh, uh, these are breaking news. These are pictures from CNN. And uh, this is, we're told, eight or nine miles outside of Kabul, the uh, capital of Afghanistan. And uh, it's, it's thought that uh, they may have hit, and we can only guess that uh, some kind of fighter jets hit some kind of a, a gas refinery there. Um, we can see tracer, fine go tracer fire going up. You can up. see a, a, the presence of a fire in the, uh, the far left of the uh now, you, what you're seeing are live pictures. This is right. new technology that has been used in the last year or so from CNN. They're called video phones. Um, I, I don't know if we can actually go to CN, CNN live and listen uh, to the correspondent. Can we do that, Rachel? Okay, we, we cannot. We cannot do that right okay. now. But you're but seeing more fire going up, and we don't know if those are explosions 
or a uh, tracer fire. Right, and we're told that, that uh, the target may have been a fuel dump, uh, but we'll no doubt get more information on that uh, as the evening wears on. Now, Osama bin Laden is at the top of the list of the suspects in connection with today's terrible attack. And the editor of an Arab newspaper in England says he was warned by Islamic fundamentalists weeks ago that there would be a huge attack. Mm. Now, in the, uh, the wake of these terrible attacks, Governor Roll and the state officials uh, are and have been taking actions to make sure that uh, things operate as smoothly as possible here in Connecticut. And the governor has said that the state is safe, uh, although in New Haven there was a, a suspicious bomb being, ch a suspicious package being checked into, but the trains are still running, so apparently that is nothing. Uh, Mark, go ahead. What do you have at this uh, hour at six minutes after six? Hi, good evening, and good evening, Keith. Good evening, everyone, from the Emergency Management Center at the State Armory here in Hartford. Uh, the armory was actually activated and locked down about 15 minutes after the second airplane struck the World Trade Center uh, shortly after 9 o'clock this morning. Uh, and the governor has been here uh, throughout the day and had two appearances here to assure people, first of all, that the state was safe and that uh, bomb-sniffing dogs had gone through at Bradley International Airport. Uh, and also uh, that there were two high priorities, one to assist New York City and to help Connecticut people get out of New York City. Here's some of what the governor said. Obviously, one of our biggest concerns is Connecticut residents who may have been working in the World Trade Center building or near the scene in New York City. It's going to take many hours and in some cases perhaps days before we're able to have a full accounting of those who may have been killed or injured during today's attack. Depot or something. Uh, here you see uh, this morning, this was about 9.30 at the Ribicoff Federal Building in downtown Hartford where some 500 federal employees work in various federal agencies. Uh, they were evacuated, uh, actually it was about 9.40 or 9.45 a.m. Also the federal court is located there. Uh, court was closed uh, and people were escorted out and told to go home. And it was shortly after that, uh, you could hear the uh, marshal there telling our camera to move away. Really? The um, you mean still state here? office buildings, state office buildings were also closed about 15 or 20 minutes later on order from the governor. Uh, now, uh, as far as uh, train traffic from New York, uh, it was suspended for a while this morning, but at about 11.30 a.m., the State Department of Transportation and the governor announced here that train traffic uh, from Grand Central Station had resumed back to New Haven and Fairfield counties, and that two trains per hour should continue and would continue at least until 8 p.m. tonight, and that extra buses would be added to the, tra to the train stations in downstate. Also, uh, the governor announced that National Guard heavy construction equipment, some 20 pieces, are in the process of being moved to Lower Fairfield County to a staging area uh, in Norwalk uh, for the disposal and the use of New York City officials in uh, retrieving and uh, pulling away the records from the World Trade Center disaster. Also, all of the Air National Guard helicopters here in Connecticut were placed on standby, and at least six or four helicopters and six persons are actually at the site uh, for the purpose of helping out. Also, the Department of Children and Families and the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services has dispatched teams uh, to Lower Fairfield County Hospitals uh, to try to help with any uh, crisis management that may be needed. Also, there are 900 beds available. As far as we know, only a few people have been brought to Greenwich uh, and Stanford Hospitals. The governor will be in Stanford tonight where there is another uh, command center at the Stanford train station. Back to you. All right, All right Mark, Mark, thank you. Thank you. We want to go live now to Andrea Stassi, where we were reporting just about an right. hour or so ago where they were uh, looking at a suspicious package, right. but train traffic was still running through. What, what's right. the deal with that, Andrea? A lot of reunions, I would imagine, uh, as well tonight. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Let me just right. update you on that earlier situation. Just moments ago, members of the New Haven Bomb Squad and police with the Mass Transit Authority out of New York City left the train station. They ended their investigation. They had been investigating a suspicious package found on the platform. We are told, luckily, that package did not contain anything dangerous. However, there is still a heavy police presence here at the train station. If you can see behind me, there are also some ambulances here. There are paramedics standing by in case folks getting off trains from New York need help. They are referring to them as the walked, walking wounded. They are here to help them if they need help. Meantime, we are hearing so many unbelievable stories from people who were in New York and witnessed this horrible tragedy. Emotional exchanges at New Haven's Union Station. Family members embrace loved ones returning from Lower Manhattan. Many dazed and clearly shaken 
after witnessing incredible tragedy. On the way to PS 89, I saw the second plane go in the side of, of the uh, North Tower, a uh, One World Trade, a huge uh, ball of flames and smoke coming out. And at that point, I decided to leave the city. I people, when you looked up and saw people falling out of the sky, I, I thought my life was over. That was it. Things were going to fall on me. We were ducking. We didn't know which way to turn, which way to look, which way to run. Just run. Many escaped to Connecticut by train, one of the few ways out of the city, after witnessing the most horrific sight of their lives. And I was just standing there, and I saw the second plane come in from the right. You know, it was just, it was just like, it was weird, just surreal. You, you knew what it was doing, but you just couldn't believe it. And as soon as it hit, I, I left. I mean, people were like, like in shock. And I just decided I'm going home. We kind of got a little freaked out about it, a little unsafe, so we just came back to Connecticut. Inside the station, paramedics stood by to tend to the walking wounded. Meantime, New Haven's bomb squad investigated a suspicious package found on the platform. Luckily, it was a false alarm. Now, behind me, you don't see much right now, but I can tell you that when those trains arrive, there are dozens of people getting off. We are witnessing some very tearful exchanges. Imagine the relief for the families waiting here. They're telling us stories. It took them an hour, two hours, three hours just to reach their loved ones by phone to know that they're okay. Tonight, they have them back home safely, but they say their prayers goes out, go out to those families who are in need tonight. Anne and Keith, back to you. Thank you, right, Andrea. Andrew. Okay, we want to go uh, back live now to our pictures from uh, CNN from uh, Afghanistan that we showed you uh, just a moment ago. You can see uh, uh, something again. burning uh, in the no distance. Idea. And uh, this is about eight or nine miles outside of Kabul. This is the capital of Afghanistan. And we do think, uh, or at least first reports from CNN, is that uh, fighter jets may have hit a gas depot there. Uh, of course, this is the home of Osama bin Laden. And there was some tracer fire uh, seen as well. As you continue to look at the live pictures from CNN, um, we also have been talking a lot about the World Trade Towers and the Pentagon, but there was also a fourth plane that went down outside of Pittsburgh today. And there was some speculation, although not confirmed, that that plane, uh, which had also been commandeered, a fourth plane may have been headed for Camp David. It instead crashed outside of Pittsburgh, and a passenger told an emergency dispatcher that they were able to get a cell phone call out of that plane that crashed uh, outside of Pits Pittsburgh that mm -hmm. it was indeed being commandeered and right. hijacked and it's believed that uh, there, there are no lives that were saved on board that jet. And, and as we, uh, we go away from those pictures from Afghanistan, also the Associated Press uh, reporting that uh, that nation's hardline Taliban rulers uh, rejected suggestions that Osama bin Laden was responsible for the terror attacks in uh, New York or Washington. That uh, from that country's hardline rulers. And it, it is also known, uh, according to the Associated Press, that there is a day of mourning tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, in Israel, and the, uh, the state of Israel is on full alert as well as we speak. All right, you, as you can imagine, uh, uh, it's been a very chaotic uh, day in New York City, people trying to, to leave the city uh, via train. News Channel 8's Aaron Cox is live at the Stamford train station where uh, a lot of people have come through. Uh, Aaron, what's the latest from there right now? Well, it's Keith, the trains are still coming through, but le fewer and fewer people are getting off. The most people getting off earlier this afternoon. Of course, relief and reunions here tonight. As these commuters come off the train, they just look in our camera and they say, I am so glad to be home. Lots of hugs. The first thing they're doing, getting on their cell phone, also to the pay phones because their phones didn't work in New York City. I heard one girl say, just tell dad I'm at the train station and I'm okay. Also, the medical teams are here. You have to remember, there are 27,000 Connecticut commuters who go into New York City every day, 12,000 from Stanford alone. Many say they're just relieved they were able to get out. My family is scared, so, you know, it's, there are multiple reasons. It didn't seem to me a smart thing to do. We were watching, and a few minutes later, we saw the second one go out. Then I was on the train, and I thought I was shook up, and a girl sitting across from me had been in the second tower, and she said she saw bodies falling from the first tower. I highly doubt that any of us will be going to work in the world tomorrow. The state police have set up a command center, and as you heard Mark Davis report, Governor Rowland is expected here later this evening. Annie Keith, to tell you a side story, there was a father and three young children who came to the train station to pick up their mother. He pulled out of his pocket and showed me. I was at the playground, and the school was passing this out, trying to tell us how to explain this to our kids. He said, I didn't let them watch TV, and I didn't tell them about it. Back to you. All right, Darren Cox, thank you. We want to remind you.
All right, Darren Cox, thank you. We want to remind you uh, that all planes across the country, the first time in the mm. nation's history, all planes are grounded everywhere. There's no air traffic until at least noon tomorrow. All right, and that would certainly include uh, Bradley International Airport and Windsor Locks. That's where News Channel H's Jody Latina is right now. She's been there uh, for the balance of the day. What's going on up there, Jody? Well, Keith, it's been clear here for about seven hours now. Nothing going in or out. The only planes that we did see were actually helicopters, and those were, the, were from the National Guard. Those took off shortly after 11 this morning. That was after they announced that they would be telling folks to get their baggage, to get back off the plane. Some were on the tarmac ready to go. Some passengers described it to us that the flight crew and the captains came over, the monitors and the speakers, and telling them that there was a terrorist attack on American soil and they would not be going out anywhere. So as you can imagine, lines backed up inside at those ticket counters as the airline folks tried to really scramble to keep folks calm, but to also let them know that they really did need to make some phone calls to find folks to pick them up at the airport to make arrangements to stay at hotels. And also, they're not allowing anyone really near the airport. We've been pushed about a half a mile away from the main terminal. They've got state police troopers at the entrances. There were bomb sniffing dogs earlier, and anyone that might have business at the airport is being asked to show a photo ID. Again, a heightened sense of security. No airport uh, planes coming in or out, and that remains the status quo across the nation. Back to you. All right, Jody. Thank you. All right, we want to remind you, hotline numbers are being set up to find out about friends or relatives mm -hmm. that may have been involved in the attacks. This is so hard to sort out, yeah. and the, uh, obviously the lines are going to be jammed. The first one, American Airlines, one 800 245 That's right. United Airlines set up a hotline number as well. It also is toll-free, 1-800-932-8555. The, the American uh, Red Cross has set up a, a crisis number. It is uh, one 877 Red Cross, there's also a, a local number, area code 203-787-6721. We also want to remind you that President Bush will address the nation. We're getting it at 9 o'clock Eastern time. We do not know where he will uh, be talking from. He mm -hmm. has been shuttled He's been on the move. He's all been over the country. All Florida, over the day. Louisiana, and uh, Omaha and today his, as well. his whereabouts are, are still secret. All right, we've got uh, the Red Cross also tells us they're just getting uh, flooded with calls for people wanting to uh, donate blood. And we want to uh, let you know about a couple of local blood drives. The Omni Hotel in New Haven will host a blood drive from 8 a.m. 8 a.m. rather until 4 p.m. on Wednesday and you can call uh, area code 203-974-6801 to make an appointment there. Yano Haven Hospital also holding a blood drive from Wednesday at 7 a.m. It'll last until 4.45 p.m. and if you can't attend and you want to donate uh, please call the American Red Cross at the uh, the numbers that we just passed along to you. And the Red Cross is going to need your help today, tomorrow, possibly for months. That's right. And uh, a lot of uh, victims of the uh, the terror attack uh, uh, into hospitals, at hospitals, uh, perhaps even headed to Connecticut hospitals. We don't even know the toll or how many people may be coming here. News Channel 8, Sarah Welch uh, was at Bridgeport Hospital. She joins us now live. Bridgeport Hospital, Sarah, as most folks know, have a burn unit there. Absolutely, and uh, members of uh, Bridgeport Hospital staff have been on standby at the train station throughout the day, as well as local firefighters and police and state police, uh, just in case those injured are taken to the Bridgeport area. It's unfathomable, heartbreaking to think of all those people who are inside the Twin Towers this morning. We spoke with one of them, a Connecticut man from Oxford, who described to us the sheer terror and pandemonium as people tried to get out. I was on the 24th floor, and uh, the first plane hit, and the building rocked to the right and back. And I opened the door of the uh, conference room, and I saw the plane go by, and people falling. It's all right, Dad. And, uh, and uh, then we started to go down the stairs, and uh, this, we got down to about 16, and all the doors on the World Karen. Trade Center, they lock. So I got, we got down to about, uh, probably about 15 or 13, or 14, and I said, you know, it was just a traffic jam for people trying to get down. And I said, everybody back up, back up. Everyone was yelling, back up. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. I just want to get home. I want to get you home. And uh, we went back up. I'm starting to calm down now. <laughs> we went back up. Do you want to stop for a second? No, no, no. I just want to go home. We went back up, we regrouped, the, the firemen started coming through, 
and uh, they let us down. Company 22 in New York City, freaking heroes. <laughs> Not one of them had fear in their eye. They all just kept going up. And we got down to the bottom in the plaza. There was bodies everywhere. They were all on fire and broken. It was just the most horrific thing you've ever seen in your life. And, uh, and uh, then we got out and uh, I had a thing of oxygen in my hand and a fire extinguisher and I almost carried it three blocks before I even realized I had it. And uh, then I just bumped into this guy and uh, we just started walking and we walked up from the Trade Center to 33rd Street and uh, everybody was lined up trying to hitchhike out of the tunnel. It was like, you know, and this guy pulled up in a, in a uh, pickup truck and drove me all the way to the ferry and I got home. And I'm home now. That was Jimmy Vesquenza Jr. of Oxford, Connecticut. As he left, his, his wife said to us she was just so incredibly grateful that she had her husband home tonight and that uh, her prayers go out to so many other families. Again, the teamwork at uh, the train station in Bridgeport, absolutely incredible. Many of those Bridgeport firefighters have said that they want to go into the city and help with the recovery. Mm. Keith and Ann. All right, Sarah, such a, a touching story. What do you have to say? Thank you. Oh, it is. Well, we want to go live now to LaGuardia Airport where we uh, join Leon Collins. Leon, what can you tell us? What a day. Oh, well, and we're out here outside of LaGuardia Airport. You can see it's an eerie sort of a quiet over LaGuardia Airport, having been closed most of today. I spoke to a man at a hotel across the street from where I'm standing. He said his airline told him there's no way that they were going to have any flights out of here before Friday. And I think at this hour, we'd only be speculating as to when things might get back to normal. I have to tell you, on my way down to New York City today, it was like a scene I had never seen before. We were crossing crossing the Whitestone Bridge, people, this was about probably 20 minutes, a half an hour after the two towers had collapsed, people had stopped their cars mid-span on the Whitestone Bridge and were watching the huge plumes of smoke just billowing out of lower Manhattan as we worked our way down to the Brooklyn side of the Brooklyn Bridge. The scene was somewhat surreal. Lady Liberty bravely held her torch as if she were trying to light smoky New York Harbor on a day that will go down in infamy. As the mass exodus from the city headed away, some people watched the disaster scene as others told what happened. And all of a sudden I heard this loud roar and I looked up and this big ass airplane, I just watched hit the, hit the building, the explosion knocked me into the fence. What was presumed to be part of a large-scale terrorist attack paralyzed New York City. Stunned people, emergency vehicles, and clogged highways made the quest for safety a common but difficult objective. It was right there. W wait, where, where in the picture? Right here. Okay. Both World Trade Centers were there. We saw the plane go into the building, pretty much. Yeah. It crashed into the building, yeah. right in front of our eyes. Our school is right across the street from, it's pretty much right across the street from the Twin Towers. And I saw the first building with probably 50, 75 floors just totally in flames with smoke billowing, them, billowing out of them. Many people cried in this great city today for loss of life and for a New York skyline that will sadly never be the same. We ran for our lives because everything was just coming right at us. The smoke, debris, I never seen anything like it. There are bodies everywhere, debris, every, it's, it's horrible. I think the, the saddest thing I heard today was from some police officers who were on the Brooklyn Bridge. And you know, from the time that the planes crashed into the towers, to the time that they collapsed. A lot of rescue workers, firefighters, police, many other types of New York City people were inside those buildings. And the officer told me he could hear other firemen, he could hear other police officers trying over their radios, obviously people who had been caught in the collapse saying, I'm stuck, I'm being crushed, I don't know where I am, I'm crying, I, I, I'm being crushed, please come save me. It was just sad, he told me, for him to stand there and not to be able to help. 
his brother, firefighters, police on a day like to this, on a day like today, they're all brothers. We now go to my colleague. Oh, first we'll go back to the anchors. Ann and Keith, back to you. Just a horrible scene down here in New York City. Right. There's no way to describe it, Leon. No, just no way. All right, we've just got this in from the Associated Press. And the AP is reporting the Greyhound bus has canceled all of its service uh, throughout the Northeast. Uh, the bus company Greyhound has also closed all of its terminals in the Northeast within one mile of any federal office building. So again, uh, the Greyhound reacting as well. Greyhound. Uh, shutting down service in the Northeast and terminals being closed anywhere near a federal office building within one mile. What we begin to realize now is that America is paralyzed tonight. None of us have seen anything like this. Uh, the airports are shut down. The buses are shut down, especially in the Northeast mm -hmm. area. We're checking on Amtrak to see. It is really unimaginable what is happening right now. And as we speak, the capital of Afghanistan is under fire. Um, that is the, the nation that gives uh, a home to a terrorist, Osama bin Laden, okay. although he is saying that uh, he had nothing to do with the attacks. Uh, the capital outside yeah. of Afghanistan is uh, under attack. Now, uh, two of the commercial planes that were uh, involved in these terror attacks uh, uh, came out of Logan International Airport in Boston uh, early this morning. That's where News Channel's Kent Pierce is this evening. Kent? Good evening, Keith. And now that we turn our attention to the investigation into how this happened, why the World Trade Center was the target, and who is responsible for it, Boston's Logan Airport has to be ground zero for federal authorities. It's still speculation, of course, but it seems like a pretty good bet at this point that somehow hijackers got on board two planes this morning, American Airlines Flight 11 and United Airlines Flight 175. The planes took off within 15 minutes of each other and crashed into the World Trade Center 18 minutes apart, killing all 150 seven people aboard and who knows how many others on the ground right now logan is basically deserted take a look at some pictures that were taken not too long ago and you can see that as with all airports around the country no planes have been allowed to land or take off here today since mid-morning unlike most other airports however logan is now the scene of an intense federal investigation to see if and how security was breached the head of security for the Mass Port Authority described how the security system works and who is responsible. It's a uh, system that we have in place uh, where there are various security responsibilities shared by the airport and by the air carriers under the direction of the FAA. Uh, the actual operation of the security checkpoint uh, is a airline responsibility. Now, there were, of course, many additional questions. Were weapons smuggled on board? Was it done through passenger entry or somehow through a ground crew? And uh, were there other attempts at hijacking that failed? We try asking all of these questions from mass port officials, and we get the same pat answer time and time again, that this is an ongoing federal investigation, and they cannot reveal any information that would compromise that. Obviously, it's the officials doing their job. But uh, as we found out all day long, nothing mm. new to report on yeah. who is responsible. All right, Ken, would imagine we aren't going to get a whole lot of official information coming out of Logan in the immediate future. Thank you. All right, we now want to go back live to the New Haven Green where people are just praying. The nation is praying. Uh, we have no idea of the magnitude of Connecticut victims, uh, but in the hours and the days to come, mm -hmm. we will begin to learn that. Verna? Well, Keith and Ann, residents have pretty much dispersed from the green. You can't see the area around me, but there are people still milling about, kind of giving each other words of encouragement. They came down to the green today to hear from ministers, rabbis, priests from various churches and synagogues in the area, just to hear something about what they should be doing, uh, how they should challenge, channel their feelings. Um, what they should do as far as looking to God. And this actually has been a very big source of tranquility. Churches all along the area of the green actually opened their doors very early today to allow people to come inside to pray, to spend some time to think about what actually happened today. One of those churches, I'm standing here right now with Beverly Delote, she attends one of those churches, First Church of Christ. We saw people out here and you saw people in your church today who were crying, people who were upset, people who just want to know why this happened. What were they able to do and get from the church today? People, at, people who stopped by Center Church today were just able to meditate, talk to our pastor, just find some kind of solace, bring some kind of relaxation to their spirits after hearing such a, such a traumatic event. Okay. 
And really quickly, how are you feeling on a personal level about this? It's tough. It's tough. When you think of the people who are, who are impacted by this, how far, how wide it's going to go, we, we, there are people who live here in New Haven who are impacted by this. This is going to be nationwide. This is a global event. All right. Thank you so much. All right. And we're going to interrupt you. We, we're, we're sorry. We need to okay. go right to network. Okay. Right, and Peter Jennings.